Hey y'all, I'm Julia Craven, and today I'm chatting with Wesley Lowry, a correspondent with CBS News and 60 and 60. And I'm so happy that you could be here. And we're gonna talk about object objectivity and how sometimes that means a little, that just means a little something different um, when white editors start talking to black journalists about it. So thanks for being here. Of course, happy to be here, Julia. All right. So last week you wrote a piece for the New York Times where you discussed this in depth. Um, so what what prompted you to to write that story? Sure. You know, I think we're in a moment. You know, people keep using this word reckoning, and it kind of is played out, like we've heard it a million times. But we're certainly in a moment in the weeks since George Floyd's death, where a lot of people have been speaking out about their own experiences, particularly in the workplace. A lot of black people have been speaking out about their experiences in the workplace and within newsrooms specifically. And one thing that comes up very often is this question of why mainstream newsrooms cannot retain black journalists, right? It's been 50, 60 years since newsrooms initially began integrating, and they only did that, by the way, because of a round of riots, and they didn't have anyone who could go into the cities to cover them. Um, and so right. a few of us got jobs, and now a few generations in. Um, what we see is newsrooms that are still having real issues uh, elevating black journalists into leadership, into management, and retaining the black journalists who they have. And one of the reasons is because of the way this conversation around objectivity um, exist right now to be clear the ideal of objectivity is really good right it's the idea the idea is that on any given story you try your hardest to be fair and get all the information right i think we all agree with that we all want that but right. what we know that's not actually how objectivity is applied in too many cases and so what we end up seeing is newsrooms that take the lived experiences of black journalists and the perspectives of black journalists and because they are different than the majority than the white majority of the newsroom they say oh well that's outside that's beyond the pale that's activist that's advocacy and so suddenly the lived experiences are being devalued and and set up set off and the journalists themselves are getting gaslit. We see this increasingly also with what I kind of think of as the appearance of objectivity. So it's not even about, is your work fair? It's, did you ever do or say anything that someone could say says you are biased, right? And so right. did you accidentally walk past a Black Lives Matter march and so now theoretically, someone could say you're one of the activists, not a journalist, right? It's not about right. a journalist. It's not about did you interview everyone and did you get the story? It's about theoretically, could someone say you're not fair? And I think that way too much of our conversation ends up being about that, about tweets, about dumb stuff like that, and not enough about journalism. journalism. Right. And so many black journalists have gotten those your tweet emails, mm -hmm. right? Where it's just like, oh, like you, you tweeted this thing. You said something factual, like black people shouldn't be gunned down by the police <laughs> and it becomes an entire conversation between you and a manager and so why do you think that white editors and white managers what why do you think that they feel as though black people black journalists rather can't be objective when it comes to our lived experiences well look i think some of this is that and, and we know this right there's polling and and studies that suggest that black Americans have many more white friends than white Americans do black friends, right? It's like, we are yeah. all 15 white people with black friends and we all know 15 white people, right? And so there's like a difference right. there. And, and so because of that, what we know in human nature, right, is that we all at times have a skepticism of things that we don't understand that we're not close to and there can be a discomfort at times being challenged by people cultures backgrounds that we don't get we, we all have that that's not like a black white thing every human is most comfortable right. with things that are most like them and then it takes time to learn and adjust right and so sometimes i mean in my own experience i might voice something as a reporter that is a very mainstream black belief and white people are like what what are you talking about? That's crazy. And they're like, okay. Like, I mean, and so it, it, because right. again, we forget that we live in different worlds. We live still in a very segregated world. We live in a world where skin color does determine a lot of, or, or plays a role in outcomes for a lot of Americans in a lot of different ways. And so because of that, if you have newsrooms that are constructed around 
primarily one type of person, they are going to recoil or they have the potential to recoil from things that challenge their kind of normative view. And what we know is the normative view in most American newsrooms is white middle class upper class. So what are some of these black truths that you've that you've voiced before where the white people around you are just like, oh my God, like like what I I, I just need an example. <laughs> well so, so so think about I mean look we would have you know we launched an entire project to count how many black people the police were killing because all the black people in the streets mm -hmm. were saying police are killing too many black people and the white people were like, are they? Let's count them. Right. right? And, and so you, you see, what you end up seeing is all of these efforts, right? You have to quantify all of these things about the lived black experience and you have to actually literally track it to the person because the normative view is not to believe what the black people in the streets are saying, right? And, and so you have things like that. Or, or, or for example, right, uh, a black American might accept as fact, they might declare as fact that like the Tea Party is racist or they, that was just a bunch of racists, they just hated Obama. Right. And right. and like my grandmother would probably just say that. Right. In a white newsroom, that's like, how could you ever accuse all of these people? But now it doesn't even matter right. how many studies come out that show that racial animus was one of the primary driving factors. We see we saw this play out in public around Trump's election, where most black reporters and commentators said it's clear that racial animus was a driving factor. And we had most of mainstream journalism bending over backwards to explain that it was really economics because it couldn't be race. The black people couldn't be right. right. And then again, as tends to be the case, then all the studies come out that show that in fact it was racial animus, and the black people were right the whole time. Right. And so you start to so you see those things, right? But you see it in smaller ways, right? In that piece I wrote for the Times, I wrote about how objective journalism and all journalism is built on a pyramid of subjective decisions. Is this a story worth covering? Is this a story we put one reporter on or three reporters on? Do we write it in a day or in a month right. or in a year? And so that's how you see stories like Flint, Michigan being largely missed at the beginning. And still to this day, I'm pretty sure they don't have clean water. And I don't know that there's a national reporter in Flint right now. Right. And so right. those are all subjective decisions that are made. What is important? What is the most important? Well, look, if you live in Flint, Michigan and your mother or grandmother or cousins live there and they don't have water, that's probably going to be the most important story to you. If you've never been to Flint, Michigan, you don't know anyone who lives there, it might not be. Right. And I'm glad you put that in your piece that um, in newsrooms, we make all of these subjective decisions, because I think that one thing people who aren't journalists aren't aware of is just how much decision making, how much thinking goes on behind the scenes and how that shapes coverage. And that's part of the reason why you have to have the right people in the right places. Certainly, like, because it's, because it's so many decisions and there are big decisions and they're small decisions, right? As we know, in a, right. in a given sentence where you put the comma really matters, what piece of context you pull in, what you don't, right? All of those right. things matter. And, and what we know, and, and this is not to say that there are not good white editors, good white reporters, it's not to say anyone can't do this. But what we know is that if your newsroom is almost completely one set of people, they are going to, in aggregate, share the same blind spots and therefore make the same mistakes or be inclined to make the same decisions. So one of the things, one of the places we've seen this pop up over and over and over again in the Trump era has been around what we're allowed to call racist and what we're not, right? And what yeah. I would suggest is that a room full of black people might make one decision about what is racist and <laughs> while a room full of white people might make a different one. Right. And I might right. suggest that the white people might set a higher barrier for what that is and the black people might have. A yes. And so what we're saying here is we know it's a subjective decision, right? A different different organizations might make a different decision about what terminology to use. Different journalists might make different decisions. But we know in aggregate, the entire industry is largely allowing white people and white men, but white people, I don't know that the gender distinction in this case matters, right? White people to make these right. decisions about what is and is not racist. And I think, that, and so suddenly we start seeing all types of weird contortions and euphemisms. And so again, an example being the president of the United States attacks Baltimore and says it's rat infested, what humans would ever want to live here. Black Americans are like, all right, yeah, it's racist. He's saying we're not, right. he's saying we're still human for living here and he's Villa, you know, right. vilifying the place where we live. And meanwhile, like earnest white journalists are like, well, we should fact check this. Technically, Elijah Cummings is just off the nice block in it too. And so it's, and it's like, guys, that's not what he was saying. Right. 
<laughs> right, like he was being very blatantly racist when he said that. <laughs> subjective distinction, but again, who is getting to make that subjective choice? And in too many of our newsrooms, it's right. a bunch of white people without a single right. black voice at the table, much less a majority of black voices at the table. Right, and like you said, a lot of white people treat races as like the worst possible thing that you could ever say to a white person. And it's just like, or maybe I'm just pointing out that you said or did something that was incredibly racist. Like, I, I don't know <laughs> that that doesn't that doesn't compute in my mind, but I'm also black. So I like, I don't know, like that doesn't work in my head. Part of it's like, because look, a lot of it's like a defensiveness. And to be clear, we all have defensiveness about all types of things. But I do, you know, but I do think that there is this big debate. And I think, again, I think this is a place where people of different races are largely grouped on different sides of this debate, where I think mm -hmm. most Americans of color, not just black Americans, but Americans who might be on the receiving end of racism, comprehend that yeah. someone can do a racism without being a Klan member, right? Like they, they, they understand yeah. that, like, that racism yes. is thing that happens, right? It's a thing that manifests, right. it shows up in an interaction, it shows up in the way someone is treated. It show While I think a lot of white Americans believe it's a yes, no checkbox. You are either a racist, all bad, or you are not, right? And and right. so I think we see those things starting to like smash together where, no, we can't, we can't say that this thing this person said is racist because then we are saying they are a racist and how do we know what's in their heart and how do we, and meanwhile, black people are like, but the thing they said was racist though. Like, what do you mean? Right. And so I think that there's a real, again, there's a push and pull there. And what I would suggest is if the rooms full of decision makers looked more like the country, if they were more black and more immigrant and more Muslim and more, that that we would have a different subjective standard for what we are allowed to call racist and what we would not. But instead, it's a lot of rich white people making the decisions, and the thing they are scared of most is someone calling them a racist. <laughs> what you, this actually reminds me, I can't find it right now, but it reminds me of this tweet from Jabuki where he was just like, <laughs> white people will say like, oh, like my dad, you know, he he's not that bad, you know, like he's not harming anybody. And meanwhile, he's a whole district attorney. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I feel like that's what happens. It's just like, there are very real implications to racism and saying racist things. And while you might not be a Klan member, you are still a person who interacts with other humans on a daily basis. And if you're also in a position of power, like say you're a news editor, you're a district attorney, you're a cop, you're a teacher, we have to check what you're saying. And even though, again, you might not have on a Klan hood, like you still gotta get checked for that because you are you hold some sort of position of power. Um, so how, how does all of this, um, just to kind of go back to objectivity specifically, how does that, and the facade of it, how does that um, hurt the coverage of Black communities? Well, a few things, right? The first is that if news coverage, if the subjective decisions of news coverage are not being made by people who have skin in the game in Black communities, they are not going to give them adequate coverage. We see this time and time and time and time again, right? Where Black communities right. are country don't receive consistent coverage. They don't receive humanizing coverage. All of the coverage is about crime and nothing else. We don't show up in any other time, right? Very often that coverage is not done by people who actually understand, right? So much of being a journalist is to be a translator, to take something that happens in the individual interaction and translate it to everyone. Well, but if you don't understand what the people are saying in the first place, how are you going to translate it, right? There are plenty right. of, you think about any number of cultural interactions, right? Um, it, that if you don't actually understand what's happening, how are you going to actually explain what's going on later, right? <laughs> right. You drop a random person into a Juneteenth barbecue and you give them no background, and they're gonna be very confused as to what's going on, right? And and so, and that's true of any culture in any place, right? And so right. I, think that, I think that all matters a lot. I think beyond that, right, we don't have, what we know is that in most of the country, uh, black communities, are at the whims of powerful white institutions, whether that be local and state governments or federal governments or federal programs or local power brokers, right? It does matter if in aggregate, all of the people showing up to do that coverage 
even if it's in the deepest, darkest part of their heart, empathize with the white person in the story, not the black person, right? right. It, it, that matters, right? And so I, I think that, again, it's important for us knowing that these processes are subjective. And, not, and again, that's not to say that we're not, everyone's not trying, everyone's not working with this, but knowing that these processes are subjective, right. it's important to at every stop make sure we are building in people who are going to challenge. You know, I think... Obama used to talk about how he wanted his cabinet to be like a team of equals who all fought with each other, right? It's like that idea, right? Yeah. That when we're talking about how to cover the Muslim ban, there should be a Muslim woman at the table yelling at us. And that meanwhile, like, a black woman's like, well, but is it this? And then a white guy's like, well, you know, like, and that's what it should be. And unfortunately, most right. of our decision-making spaces in journalism are seven white guys, six white women, and a black guy making it, you know, having to make it. Right. And they're like, Jerome, what do you think about this? And he's like, oh, here we go. And I, and I think that we've got to like right. think about that too. The positions we put the handful of black people in newsrooms in constantly. Right. And another thing that I really enjoyed, well, I, I loved your entire piece, but another thing that really stood out to me was um, you denoted the difference between objectivity and telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And that, I, I feel like I myself am always saying like, it's not about this facade of objectivity. It's not about me not having a, an opinion as a human being. Um, it's about me doing my job with integrity and making sure that I'm honest. Um, so I just would love for you to talk more to the audience about that. Cause I think that's such an important point to make. Sure. You know, I, I think that there is a, Again, I think it's really important to try to be fair, right? And I think if people look at my work, you know, I'm not a take artist, right? Like, it's not like I spend a lot of time trying to work and report and be fair to everyone involved in the story and to ask challenging questions, even of the people who I think I might agree with. And also, right. it's important to not allow the desire to feel or be balanced to let people say untrue things in our stories. Right? Yes. It's, we, we know that climate change is real. Now, there might be a debate over what the next best step is to combat it, right? That's a debate, right? Yes. There might be a debate, over, but there's not a debate that climate change is real, right? And so I think, and so we right. don't necessarily need to bring someone in to argue that side of it, right? There is not, in my right. space, in the space, I'm, I'm a, in the space I'm in, it's clear that, um, it, it's, it's very clear that, uh, um, that there are systemic inequities in law enforcement, right? It's clear that black people are pulled over more, they're shot and killed more. Right. There's no debate about that, right? But balance journalism right. would suggest I let all types of people make all types of claims that how that's not really true, right? Well, no, there's no objective reading of the stats, the statistics and the facts that, that don't show there are systemic issues in law enforcement. Now, again, how do we combat that? That's a, that's a thing that's up for debate, right? How bad right. is it? Another thing that might be up for debate. How urgent of a problem is it? That might be up for debate. But to allow someone to suggest that these issues do not exist would not, again, balance might suggest I do that. The truth would not suggest that. Right. And that's also irresponsible. I feel like we get into, we, we just get into irresponsible territory when we, when we do that. Like when we um, allow tom cotton to get in the new york times and say oh my god like the military needs to come in and like shut down protests it's just like and then he's spewing all of these inaccuracies in this piece and it's just like that's not hearing the other side like you're you're veering into what some people may perceive as being even propaganda um so yeah <laughs> <laughs> that didn't end in a question. Yeah, that was not a question. <laughs> Julia, I know you've got some questions coming in. I'm going to quickly grab my computer charger so I don't drop out on y'all. <laughs> and so go while you because I would be I'm, very upset I'm, if you did. So go for <laughs> it. <laughs> and I am going to find a question to ask him whenever he gets back. Okay. All right. All right. So how, so one, one other thing I was worrying, wondering about, I, I can't talk, um, is 
So there is often this depiction of journalists as very stoic, emotionless, opinionless beings um, who just kind of operate as these arbiters of truth. And I was just wondering if that's ever been something that has been projected onto you, because I feel like it's been projected onto me more than I care to even think about, truly. Yeah, well, I do think that there is this strange desire sometimes to project a journalist as personality. Like, I don't have a, I don't have a life. I don't have a personality. I'm a journalist. And I actually think our lives, right. our backgrounds, our interests are the things that make us interesting and make us good journalists in the first place. And, and, I, and again, I think that that's a really privileged position to be in, right? You don't get to have objective remove about the Muslim ban if you're a Muslim or, or about police killing black people if you are a black person or about you know, immigration policy if your family are immigrants, right? White people get to go, I could never have an opinion on any of those things, right? And everyone else is like, yo, this is our lives, right? <laughs> what does that? And, and so I, I think that, like I said, I'm not someone who fetishizes that type of remove. Like, it, again, I think that our identities make us better journalists. And, and I think that's really important. I, I also think that one of the most dangerous things that can happen in journalism is to be a biased person and believe you are not, right? And I think so often, a yeah. lot of our colleagues are like, I could never have any biases. I could never have any opinions. And we're like, we know you. We watch you. We interact with you. You know, you, We see how you shape your stories. <laughs> correct. And, and, I, and again, I think that the most important thing for us to do as journalists is to recognize our biases so that we can challenge them, so we can check ourselves, right? Have I been tough enough right. on the people who might be inclined to agree with? Have I been fair to the people who I think are the villains of this story or who I think who are wrong? Right? And I don't think that that's necessarily something that we always see other folks doing. I think black journalists have to do this all the time. Right. And I think, um... I think one thing that I've noticed is that sometimes it feels um, politics and social issues. When I see a lot of our our peers talking about it, it it seems like they kind of view them as abstracts. And I remember a couple years ago, I got into it on Twitter, which this isn't news, obviously, mm -hmm. me getting into it with somebody on the internet. But um, I got into it with a fairly prominent white journalist about um, something to do with healthcare or Medicaid or, or something. And I don't remember exactly what they said, but I remember being like, hey, you're up here talking about this as if this is some wildly abstract concept for you. But if my Nana loses her Medicaid and she has all of these chronic illnesses, she can't afford healthcare. Like, like my like my grandmother could die. Like this is not a game for me and this is not a game for so many people. And it may be something cool for you to think about and talk about and banter with other people on Twitter about, but for so many of us, it has very real implications. And that is one thing that I've seen different with the COVID-19 coverage is that it seems like a lot more people are realizing that the story can affect them. Certainly. Although what I will say is that even in that coverage, that hasn't necessarily meant that we've had sustained coverage in all the places that have been the hardest hit. But what we know with COVID-19 is that Black Americans and now Latino Americans that have moved to the Southwest of the country are the hardest hit and are disproportionately hit, right? And why are they so hard hit? Why are they disproportionately hit? Because we know, the data suggests, because of the health disparities that already existed before the, the pandemic was here, right? They already didn't necessarily right. have access to primary care. They already had to make decisions. Um, black, there's been some studies that have suggested that black COVID patients show up to the hospital at a later stage in their infection, in right. part because they are primed to not go to the hospital because they don't have the money or the access to health care, right? right? And so I, I think that there is a lot of, um, you, you know, and so again, I do think that in a story of the COVID, it has exposed you know, and, and it has caused and prompted a level and extent of coverage that looks a little different than we might normally get on issues like this. And also even mm -hmm. within that, you know, there's still a lot of black and brown communities around the country that if we wanted to cover this as a crisis, that's where we would be right now. And I'm not saying no one's there, and I'm not saying none of that work's being done. I'm saying, I think if we looked at it in the totality of all of the coverage, 
it would probably underrepresent the extent to which the story of COVID is a story of right. black and brown America. Right. And so this kind of, this entire conversation kind of leads into how, which you said earlier, how black people are treated within our newsroom. And there was another New York Times piece um, about the Washington Post and how how things how things were going there um, apparently, and so I just wanted to ask you: Were you shocked by that piece? And for people watching who, by chance, don't know who Wesley is, Wes used to work at the Post. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, there was some wild stuff in that piece. Definitely some stuff I didn't know. Some other stuff that I was kind of aware of. Um, you know. Yeah. The upshot of that piece was, you know, about some tensions that appear to be happening in that newsroom and that clearly are happening in newsrooms across the country, which is that, again, as has been true forever, uh, black reporters and other journalists are underrepresented in these mainstream newsrooms, um, ask for things like fair pay, access to promotions, uh, attention and validation to be heard when we raise our voices for ideas and to be able to enter management. And largely, systemically, the answer from newsrooms is no. What's different in this moment is that all these black reporters and journalists have Twitter feeds and can say, hey, guess what just happened to me again? And a lot <laughs> right. of the white managers don't like that. It threatens their power structure. And so we see a lot of cases where, and again, and I think that, that the crackdowns that come on black journalists and black reporters are often done in the name of objectivity. Right. If you're an activist, if you're talking about media diversity or fair coverage of black people, then you're too biased to cover black people. Right. They, and so they use right. these two things to silence criticism of their own institution. And I think that that um, is unfortunate. You know, that piece itself, though, like I said, it was not necessarily surprising to me because what we know, again, is that our, um, our newsrooms, while not formally segregated, Almost all, if you're in a majority white newsroom, almost all have a black, that black network of black people who all talk to each other all the time, right? And so we know what right. so-and-so in video was going through. We know what happened over here with the person on the local desk. We know, you know, and so right. unfortunately, a lot of the things that I read in that piece were not things I was hearing for the first time. Yeah, which is really sad. And that's why so many institutions can't retain black talent. Of course. Because who wants and, to stay somewhere where they're treated like that? And beyond that, right, it's about cultural shift. I mean, the Post, I, I think it's exciting. I mean, the Post announced following some of this initial report, they were going to hire a bunch of uh, new positions at the Post, which I think are great. They're all positions that I think should exist and should already yeah. exist. Probably. And also, if you run 10 black people out, the solution is not to say, okay, we're going to hire 20 black people this time, right? Because if you don't change the culture and the systems that ran the first 10 out, you're just going to end up running out twice as many black people this time. And so what I hope, right. for, oh, because I love the Post and I have so many dear colleagues and friends there, and I, it's my hometown newspaper, I'm a DC lifer, it's always going to be my newspaper. But the thing I hope for the Post is that it really addresses some of the structural cultural issues it has there that lead to such an exodus of black staff members year after year after year after year, not just trying to, you know, shuffle in a new set of black faces to replace the last set they ran off. Right. And now we can get into some viewer questions. Um, so we have a cue from Maya and she's asking, do you feel objectivity as it is currently presented is the perspective of white men? Ooh, that's a good one. I think that too often what is considered objective is determined by white men. Again, and again, what I would say is I would flatten the gender there. I think that it, it, it gets determined by white decision makers, right? I've worked for many, many more white women than I ever have black men or black women, right? And, yeah. and solving the gender there would not necessarily solve the race issue. Um, and so that's yeah. the reason I think that distinction, not that gender doesn't matter in those conversations, it does. Because um, again, newspapers make and media outlets make decisions every single day about what's objectively true, what is something we can say plainly, and what is something that we have to cite and source. And, and again, who are the decision makers in aggregate of those decisions? White journalists who are reporting to white journalists who are reporting to white journalists. And I think that that skews, again, when is it okay to call something racist? 
get a room full of black people together and a room full of immigrants and a room full of Muslims and a room full of, uh, of white people, and you're going to end up with five different lines. Which one right. of those groups to make that decision for the media? It's always the room full of white people. Right. Yeah. And I agree with that. And so Bob wants to know, should there be more black owned media outlets in order to fix this issue? I'm on the you fence know, about that one. Yeah. You know, I'm really, you know, look, I, I love and, and like to support black media. I think it's really important because it's a really crucial function. Um, yeah. And when you look at the history of black, black media, specifically black newspapers, even prior to the current age, a lot they popped up because mainstream media could not be trusted to pay attention to right. what's happening in communities, much less to provide true and accurate coverage of those communities. That said, it's difficult, right? It's very difficult um, to maintain such outlets. It, it can be difficult to right. find an audience for them. It can be, you know, it becomes a niche as opposed to something that, as opposed to like a behemoth like the New York Times, which does everything, right? And so, right. like I said, I, mean, I think it's really important to support Black-owned media outlets. I'm not sure that it will that that they alone can solve these issues. And secondarily, right, mainstream media outlets will always exist, and they will always have a a big chunk of the media power. And so, as long as they have that power, it's hyper important that there be pressure push, put on them to do this better. Right. And I also, my my fear with, um, instead of addressing the root of issues um, directly, and yeah, my, my fear is, um, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. My fear is that if the root is not addressed, it, the problems will persist regardless of whether or not there are more black owned media outlets, um, which is why I was saying earlier, I'm a bit on the fence about that one. I just don't know if, more black outlets alone, as much as they are needed, will fix the root of the problem either. Um, and so Christy wants to know, how can the average consumer or viewer contribute to the diversity of journalists? Well, okay, I think a few things are true. I think the first is to make it clear um, when you interact with the leaders of newsrooms that this is something that you're judging them engaging them. Right, our editors get a lot of emails about typos and sentences. They don't get a lot of emails about, hey, you just hired a new Africa bureau chief and this looks like a white guy from the suburbs, <laughs> right? Or, hey, right. Um, I see that your entire local government team here in this city that is 70% black is all white people, right? I think that, right. um, you know, leadership is responsive to the things they hear about. And in fact, in many cases, leadership is very responsive to readers. And, I, and I, so I think that hearing from the readers is important. Beyond that, I think reading and supporting and promoting the work of the people doing that work in those spaces is also important. Uh, because we know that black and, and brown and all types of journalists of color, right, not just black journalists, face real difficulties inside these newsrooms and are very often feel like they're going it alone. And so uh, supporting them and supporting their work is a way, is a small way to try to make sure they can keep doing that work. And Alicia wants to know, how concerned are you that the lack of diversity on non-race beats renders Black people invisible in healthcare, education, the military, et cetera? What's the most important way to address that? I, you know, look, I think that is really important. And it's been kind of one of these questions that has uh, come up in this conversation for generations, right? As a Black journalist, do you want to be the Black journalist who covers the race stuff, or do you want to be known for other stuff, right? And, in, mm -hmm. and there's always a debate. Right? I remember getting this question a lot when I started doing some of the work that I did. Are you worried about being pigeonholed? Are you worried about... And my answer yes. has always been that... Well, so so I, I, I don't worry about it at all. Right? I know it, and, and one reason right. why I do is that like, I want to be on the best story and the most important story. And in, and in my space, some of the most important stories, I, I think some of the most important stories in general have major racial components. That said, we have to figure out a way in our newsrooms, and again, I think one way, hopefully, to do this is through black managers and diversity at the top of our newsrooms. One, we have to figure out a way to make it clear and incumbent upon everyone that race is a major component of everyone's beat in every job, right? If you are covering yes. the United States of America, much less the world, how do you do that without delving into race? 
and ethnicity and culture, right? It touches everything right. in our society. And I think that too often that burden falls to black people. I think, we, again, we get framed with this unfair question of, are you worried about doing this work? And the question should be, why isn't everyone else doing it? And again, I don't know how to fix that short of people who are smart enough to know that race is everywhere, finally being in decision-making positions. Right. And the pigeonholing is a really good point. I remember very early on in my own career where someone advised me, quote unquote, um, to just be careful of only doing race stories because I was going to pigeonhole myself. And my response to that was, how am I going to pigeonhole myself when I cover everything? If I cover racism, <laughs> I cover everything. Like, how, how can I possibly not have range if I'm covering something that affects every beat. Exactly. Um, just one of those other, it's one of those fun things that gets said to us all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for joining me today. Um, so tell us a little bit about your new show. I'm not going to let you go without you, you know, telling us about that. Sure. Yeah. So I'm at CBS. I'm working on 60 and 6, which is a offshoot of 60 Minutes um, on the mobile app Quibi, which you've probably seen uh, some jokes on the internet about. Um, the Quibi is a dope mobile app. Um, 60 and 6 is basically 60 minutes, only a little bit shorter. And so doing high end, really important uh, kind of news documentary style journalism. And so uh, just last week, I popped a piece from Baltimore about three young black men who were railroaded by the system, convicted of a murder they didn't commit, and spent 36 years in prison. And I did the first long sit down with them. My colleague, Lori Siegel, mm -hmm. today uh, just published a new piece on AI bots about these companion bots that people have, where they're like computer friends, mm -hmm. um, more or less. Um, it was fascinating. I don't know anything about tech, and I watched every minute of that. Like, very fascinated. And so you can check it out on the Quibi app. Um, and then I'm obviously everywhere, everywhere else. But I'll shut up because I know that you got a really cool guest for next week. And I want to make sure you can come over to Yes. So next week, we will be back and we will be talking with Aaron Haynes about Black women, the election, voting, and just a, a lit. I'm just going to ask Aaron about so much because um, I think she's brilliant and I'm excited to speak with her next week. Um, and you are also brilliant. And thank you so much for your time today, Wes. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Julie. I appreciate you. All right. All right. Take care, y'all. Um, and come back next week. <laughs>